Nothing worth anything is easy. It's so challenging, it's so murky. I just rarely get it right the first time. Two out of 100 people would read the average blog all the way to the end. That's the contrast that's going on. It was one of those experiences where you, ju you just see a door opening. It scared me to think about it. Mystery and wonder. This really kills it when you name it. Just tons of stimulation. Culture has become nature. I'm an absolute full-on art geek. Whether you like their work or not, like they're in it. You know, I really like this. Hey everyone, I am super excited uh, to be having this uh, conversation with John Seed. John is the author of this very cool book called Disrupted Realism, who I found out through Chad Little, uh, Academy member, he was telling me about this book and then one thing led to another and I found it and then I um, got a hold of John. His background is he teaches art or has taught art, which led him into teaching the history of art uh, he's a writer, a blogger, an art critic, and it's just, it's just so interesting, John, because you're, the way you've come through and you've come to producing this book, it's very serendipity, you know, all, all of these things led to this, and, and the fact that you're an artist as well, I think it's, and you're, in your writing and your curation of these different artists in this movement and, and putting words to what you're seeing as a movement, I think it's just, it's uh, just really, really cool, really, really interesting. So thank you so much for being here today. Great introduction. No, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Well, you know, like I just was kind of, that's what got me interested in it was that you've had the creative path in a way of an artist, you know, they do one thing which leads to another thing, you know, you began in art possibly and you started teaching and how did, how did you kind of get into this? Uh, well, I, I mean, there, there's so many bird walks. Uh, we yeah. But, but I, I think the short version is that I always was uh, making things. I was a hands-on kid. Yeah. I mean, my parents would tell you and puppet shows and drawing, uh, model airplanes, bicycles. We had a workshop behind the garage. So I got to college and was really uh, undecided big time. Uh, you know, I didn't know which direction I was going to go. And my second semester of freshman year, I took a class called Monotype with Nathan Oliveira, famous. Oh, uh, no kidding. So you, oh, wow. And it was one of those experiences where you, ju you just see a door opening. It's like, hey, there's a door open here if you want to walk through it. And I just, I got so much from Nathan. I wanted to listen to him all the time. I'd go to his office hour whenever I could. I eventually uh, stretched canvases for him in his studio. And by finding a mentor, I really found a, a career. I just was absolutely launched into this whole world of art. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Nathan. Wow. I, I've actually heard that he, he was kind of a hard ass teacher. Um, I don't know if that was your, you know, like he, he was pretty straight up with people. I think I got him at a very, very good time. I found yeah. him very amenable, but, but I heard stories. Uh, I've been doing some writing about Nathan, and I interviewed a woman who uh, studied with him when he was brand new. Uh, he came to Stanford in 1964, and he was teaching a lithography class with his own press. And this woman, now she's a realtor. This is, you know, 50 years oh, wow. uh, later. She said that she still opens a peanut butter jar a certain way because of the way that Nathan said they had to open and close the litho ink. He gave, a, he gave a lesson on jar opening and closing. So she remembered wow. that. Wow, wow, yeah. Oh, well, God, that, well, that's, okay, so that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down. But so, so he was a huge influence for you. He, he was a big influence. And then, again, to just you know, keep it without, without yeah. too much detail, my epiphany, uh, I'm going to say that the style, the kind of art that really opened up to me was Bay Area figurative painting. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, you and I could have a beer and talk all day, you know, what, talk Diebenkorn and David Park and yeah, yeah. Bischoff. And in graduate school, uh, some of the greats were still teaching. So I took classes with Joan Brown and Elmer Bischoff. And then through wow. Nathan, I met uh, Richard Diebenkorn and got to visit his home and, and spend time with him. So I got this incredible view into a lot of these artists that formed, I'm going to say they formed my values as an artist. Mm -hmm. they, they gave me something to look up to and a lot to think about. You know, you were painting, but you were also, then you got a job teaching, right? Well, you, there, was, there was an in-between. The in-between was, I, I had this kind of life where, just like you said, it was serendipitous. I bounced around. I left Berkeley just at the time 
that the art field was really heating up again in the early 80s. And long story short, I worked for Larry Gagosian when he was a brand new young art dealer just starting out. And I stretched canvases for Jean-Michel Basquiat, and I met uh, Robert Maplethorpe and Eric Fischel. And, it, and I look back now, at the time oh I knew it was Oh my But now at, uh, at 62, I look back and I go, oh my gosh, you know, what did I kind of wander into? But I had a very schizoid, uh, kind of a schizoid relationship with art in the art world, because as a student, I had experienced so much, uh, I'm going to say sincerity and, and kindness. There was so much to admire in my teachers. But when I began to work for an art dealer, I saw the, you know, the hard driving, uh, the, the alpha dog side mm -hmm, of the art, mm -hmm. art world. And there was a lot that really turned me off. I, I'm not alpha, you know, I'm out of yeah. the, the nice guy yeah, right. mold. Uh, Jim Henson is my hero, right? You know, hey, yeah. I'm a puppeteer. <laughs> And so uh, that led me to, I steered my way into teaching. By 1986, I had gotten a full-time community college teaching job, and I did that for nearly 32 years before retiring. Oh, okay. So, yeah, right, right. And I, I think I read somewhere that you, you started out in the studio arts and then just agreed to, oh, well, I can throw in a little art history uh, for you, no problem. And that, that led to deeper and deeper study for you and students in, in that field of art history. That, that, I mean, that's exactly what happened. It was a small school. And in my first interview, they said, can you teach art history? And I, you know, I kind of choked on it. Well, uh, yes, yeah, I, I can teach art history. And I, I taught it with a textbook on the bedside table. And about five years in, I began to say, you know, I really like this. This, yeah. this is kind of where my, my head is at, and I spent more time. I really, as I taught, I educated myself. Mm -hmm. That's one mm -hmm. of the classic things that, that you know, teachers are, is they're people who like to self-educate. And I taught, I think I taught the survey class, uh, Renaissance to 19th century art. I taught it 64 times before I retired. Oh, my God. And you get a, you get a feeling for the material as you change the class, and you change the syllabus, and you change mm -hmm. what you lecture about. It was just, it just got deeper and deeper. Wow. Wow. And just, like, what was your art doing while the, all this teaching? Were, were you able to like keep that thread going pretty well? It, it went through a couple of phases. I, I'm going to say the first phase was the wedding present phase. Where I wasn't <laughs> painting much, you know, but someone would get married and I think, oh, I have to, I have to do a little painting and I would, you know, do a yeah. little painting in the garage. But what happened is that over time I became my job. I, I really became a professor and it was more about grading papers I was yeah. married you know I was a family man uh -huh. and all my priorities changed even the wedding uh, <laughs> the wedding gift paintings yeah. began to fall away and then I hit a big uh, oh how do I describe this I had a year where I tell people it was like Wiley Coyote going off the cliff um, I, I went through cancer and divorce in the same year I was very, very ill and didn't teach for eight months. Jesus. But, what, what year was this? I mean, was this like 20 years? 2002. 2002. Wow. Yeah. But when I came out of it, a couple of things happened. One was I really began to think about, was I exposed to carcinogens through being a printmaker and a painter? Had that been maybe part of what led to my uh, cancer? Uh -huh. So that was on my mind. Uh -huh. But the other thing was that uh, just before I had become ill, a friend had asked me to write a magazine article and I found out I was, I was good at it. I had, you know, considered myself an art writer before, but when I was actually finishing chemo, uh, I won an award. I won a professional journalist award in art and entertainment writing for the first magazine page piece I ever published. And so I kind of wow. came out of illness and I thought, okay, uh, new life, new marriage, remission, all these things are different. Why don't I try writing? So I had a big uh, turning point. So then you started to double down on the, on the actual writing. And that's that when you started your blog? And The blog came a little bit later. The blog came, uh, <laughs> it was a wonderful convergence. Think the death of the newspaper and the rise of the internet. Yeah, you that's hit it, man. You timed this perfectly. I know, I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but it's perfect. No, it was accidental. My wife, my, my second wife, my wife, Linda, was a front page editor for the uh, San Diego Union Tribune. So she's an editor writer. And after we got married, we saw, you know, newspapers begin to struggle. And as they were struggling, and as that was a big topic for Linda and her, her peers, uh, someone said, you need to write for the Huffington Post, which was the first free, fully internet based uh, internet right. newspaper. So in June of 2010, I posted my first blog. And I ended up writing an art blog a week for seven years, 
So it was over 350 blogs uh, before wow. I quit on my 60th birthday. I said, now it's time to retire from that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that just put you on the map and connected with you so many people and artists. Yeah. And yeah. I was wow. a different person after I did that. I really, I was a small town art teacher with a dog and a mortgage, you know, when I started. And by the time I was done, it, it was just, it's like meeting you today on, on Zoom. I just kept meeting people. Yeah. And when I'd write about someone, they'd say, well, you know, I have a friend that you really, here's the Yeah, yeah. It and, just, you know, it just, it's a web, right? right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. This book, um, you know, it, it came out of these blog connections and meeting different artists. And I know that there was the gallery in Philadelphia that had the show that, you know, and all that. Can you just, just the quick overview of how you moved to go from blogging to like taking on this project? Well, first I want to say something about what I discovered about blogging. I mean, it was, a, it was new territory. Blogging was a new thing right. when it started. And if you think about it, traditional art writers, traditional art critics, were usually situated a newspaper or magazine. An editor would tell them, you're writing about this topic this week. You'd have so many column inches, you might get one photo, probably not in color, and then what you wrote would be cut down by the editor. Right. What I got into with blogging was I would write about what I wanted to write about. So the cool. The length that I wanted. Uh, I could insert videos over time. You know, I could add, add images. And at the Huffington Post, I, I think I can say this now, they would read my post and just say, is this actionable? <laughs> actionable, right. <laughs> yeah, a, if, if they weren't going to get sued, they would post it. <laughs> and another thing that was great about it is when you write for art magazines, even, you know, the, the better ones, you're conscious of the fact that galleries are paying your bills because they're the advertisers. Right, right. Whereas at the Huffington Post, I was selling, I think, uh, diet pills and exercise machines and uh, yeah. sleeping but aids. You have so much more freedom, you know. Right. You're, just, you're just making cool content. So I got into this, and my friends, the people that I knew best, in fact, I'm going to show you, here's, here's one of them. That's a portrait that uh, Scott Hess did of me. Oh, I love his work. And uh, he was a he friend. He did that portrait of you? Wow. Yeah. Is that pastel or oil? What is it's, that? It's oil. It was blogged in the Huffington Post. We blogged the process of doing it together. We made, a, we made an article out of it. Wow. Wow. Oh, God. I didn't know you knew him really well. Because you were no, living no. in L.A., by, or Southern California at that time. Yeah. He was living next to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles on West Washington. Oh, my James God. James Marshall moved out, and he moved in. Yeah, well, we'll share we'll share his work here when we're not everyone maybe knows his work, but um, oh my God, that's so amazing! So you connected but, with him. But what I was really finding when I started out was that uh, there wasn't a lot of good writing being done about representational painting, uh, and yeah. it was sort of the low hanging fruit at, at that time. Everything had to deconstruct. Everything had theory. There was a lot of conceptual, mm -hmm. and so I just began calling up people that I thought you deserve a good profile. And over time, that began to be kind of the avenue of writing I took, writing about representational painters, even though people come up to me now and they say, well, you're the guy, you're, you're all, you know, representational painting all the time. And I say, no, I'm not. I say, I'm on the board of the San Francis uh, Foundation. Uh -huh, I, mean, I, love, right. I, love ex I love abstract painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was the, the low-hanging fruit. It was what wasn't being written about. And that's how the dots began to connect with familiarity with you know, yeah. realism and, and how are things changing. And um, Scott was very, very important. It's a good thing we, we brought him up because after I ma he made that portrait, we got invited to a conference at the John Natsoulis Gallery in Davis. Uh -huh. And Scott was a featured speaker and his talk was titled Discombobulation. Okay. And Discombobulation, it was a lot of things, but he's a good scholar of painting. He talked about motion in painting and how motion had been represented in old master painting, how it showed up in contemporary painting. He was doing paintings himself where he would take an iPhone and scan a crowd and jiggle it and then try to paint that. Right. And he, talked about, he talked about what he was doing. So I came away from this thinking, boy, I'm seeing a lot of painting where what Scott talked about is, is happening. There's some kind of con visual confusion. There's a visual. Yeah, it's like, it's like a glimpse, you know? It's like a memory glimpse. Yeah. So he was the first one that kind of said, there's something here. And then that led to a blog for the Huffington Post. And I'm going to think, I, I'm not sure if I, got, I remember the title right. I, I think discombobulation in painting, it's a thing. That's it's a, a thing. A, a blog title or right? something, uh -huh. something, you know, catchy like that. And that was read by Vanessa Waring 
who was uh, running the front desk at the Stanek Gallery. Oh. And she said to Catherine Stanek, she said to the owner of the gallery, I think this would be a good show. And wow. Catherine agreed, and that's how the show got rolling. Oh, wow. And then wow, at that show, a publishing rep came in, and it was like step two, I think this would be a good book. And so the book came from, from that. That's the, the chain of events. Okay, okay. So how, And you know what's amazing? It's like if you think about it, you, you were like the position that you held or the, or, the, or the opportunities that you created for yourself, all these, you're looking at so many artists. Like, you know, I mean, you, the fact that you're an artist and that you had that experience – and you had the experience with art history to, uh, to sort of look back at all those Fauvist movements, all that stuff. And then to be, be checking the pulse of contemporary art making because you're just interviewing all these artists. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm so busy with my own art. I, I, I don't ha I have a little bit of bandwidth for other people, but really I'm, I'm preoccupied. But it seems to me that this is, you know, it's kind of amazing you were able to you know, you just came along and you were able to oversee everything, sort of say, hey, there's this disrupt, this realism disruption, this change in realism that's happening now. Why is it happening? What's going on? And started that conversation. I mean, I know that many people are contributing to it, but do you know what I mean? Have you ever thought about that? How oh, it's yeah. kind of remarkable. Like, well, there's two, two things I want to say. The first one is quick. I'm an absolute full-on art geek. Uh, there's no other way to say it. I obsess about art the way some people obsess about sports or music or uh -huh. I'm sure you're the same way. I just, whatever I get into, I get in very, very deeply. That's kind of how the people in my family are. We, you know, we dive, we dive deep. Right, right. But the other thing is going back to blogging. So I was situated, I was living two hours from Los Angeles when I started blogging. So on the weekend, you know, I could see shows, but the traffic was getting worse uh -huh. and not everything I wanted to see could be, seen. So I developed a policy. If I can't see someone show, I would interview that person. Oh. And I started out interviewing you know, Californians, but then I interviewed people in New York. Eventually I interviewed people anywhere because that's a format that, uh, you know, can move around and travel. So back to what you were saying, I did end up with a kind of view that yeah. most art writers wouldn't get because it was wherever the internet could take me, I could interview someone. Yeah. I think the tally was, was 114 interviews by the time I was, really? uh, was done. So that gave me that, you know, kind of that big picture. Yeah, yeah. Very, very cool. So how that name came up and, and just the idea, <laughs> what is dis disrupted realism? And, and, you know, I just love this, by the way. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a good story. And it's, uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, subject, you know, title for a book and, and for the whole thing. It's just beautiful. Well, you know, it, Nick, if you knew me a little bit, maybe I'll remind you of someone you know. I'm one of those people, I just rarely get it right the first time, whatever it is in life. Second or third or fourth time, I start to hone in. You know, I kind of get there. Uh huh. So I was all excited after the publisher's rep came in. I thought, we are going to do the discombobulation book. Ah. And I would say that. And everybody kind of, you know, it was right. a little cringeworthy. And uh, anyways, Catherine Stanek had a conversation. She talked to Alex Konevsky. She talked to a couple of people, and they said in a very kind way, you know, John, this needs to be reframed. We, can, we yeah. can do better here. So out of a big conversation, disrupted realism seemed to be the best description for saying that uh, something subjective was happening, something had been broken, something was uh, open. Yes, yes. What you have in that title is you have two things now. A thing that we all get, realism, we all know that, but then we have disruption, and that creates the tension. When we have discombobulation, we, it's like calling it confusing. You know, it's, right, it's, it's right. just a piece of it. But uh, so, so you started out with discombobulation, which actually, I love that word. I mean, I, I I've, never, I've never heard an artist, I mean, I talk about this, idea a lot and uh and, and it's challenging to talk about it so that's when i heard disruptive realism i thought man that is i'm going to be able to use this you know but discombobulation is an, another one um well you know as, as, when you teach art history you find out a lot of the names of famous periods in art started out with an, ins an insult uh you know baroque was, was like that it kind of meant oh like a like a freshwater pearl all irregular all, all broken oh yeah and, it wasn't the fovis like a wild beast or something the wild like beast yeah. 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 The art critic, the French art critic said, Oh, look at Donatello with the wild beasts. 
Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. But, so did these come out as, they start as insults? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I think when people heard discombobulation, you know, they would say to me, John, I don't want to go down in the books. If this thing takes, I don't want to go down as one of the great discombobulators of the 21st Oh, century. yeah. So the artists that were kind of <laughs> yeah. being included in this show. Wow. Okay. But, but anyways, let's, let's talk about, about yeah. uh, what it is, because yeah. what it is is important. And I want to tell you, because I've done a couple of podcasts and I've been talking to people, I can tell you a reaction that some of your viewers are having to this video interview right now. I, I absolutely can tell you. Okay, great. They're listening to this and they're thinking, oh, I hate this. And I hate this because this book is going to limit what artists do. It's creating a new label and you have to be within the label. And now it's a certain thing. And uh, uh, this, really, this really kills it when you name it. So I always tell people, I try to kind of uh, ally that fear. And, and the way that the book is written, and you, you know, you'll be able to show this later in your editing, but there is the opening of the book. But right. The book has six different sections. And the way it was put together, the first thing that really, really mattered to me was just simply quality. Uh, I tried to choose artists that I thought were really, really great artists that I could. You respect. did. You did. That, and that's something that really struck me. It's like super solid. Like these guys, are, whether you like their work or not, like they're in it. <laughs> you know, these guys are in it. These men and women, beautiful, beautiful, I, strong. I'm work. glad it feels that way because yeah. that, that was, you know, number one, because I wanted to be about the artists as much as it could be and not about me. I wanted to minimize me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then the other thing is that, as I looked over the material, and I had this in my Dropbox for about a year, you know, collecting images and collecting artists and yes to this person and no, no to that person, um, I began to see trends. And with the trends, just as with the title, I didn't want to put brackets around something and say, we're done here. I wanted to say, here are some ways that you can open up conversation about the art and the artists by bringing up some themes and some shared values or some shared ideas. So there are six sections in the book towards abstraction. Mm -hmm. Alex Tanevsky, Jerome Lagarigue, Alex Merrick, uh, Kai Samuels Davis. All of them seem to have a very strong connection to, to modernism and to uh, abstraction. Also to Bay Area painting in some cases, which was yeah. modern, something I really uh, connected with. The guy disrupted bodies and emotions and identities and myths and visions. So you, you're opening it up right from the get-go. What the intention of the book is, what I really like to hear from people, and I mainly am hearing it, is that after they get the book, they have better conversations with other artists about the, the material, what they like, what they dislike, mm -hmm. who they respect. And that's what the book is really meant to be. It's meant to be, if we're going to start a conversation, here's who you should look at, and let's have the best conversation we can about what's happening. And yeah. open it up further. Yeah. So that little paragraph that you've crafted about disrupted realism, do you want to read that? It's, it's really great. Or do you, you want know, me to? I can read it. Or would you like to hear my video read it if I do screen share? Because I have it here in a video with some images. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. What is disrupted realism? Disrupted realism is a term that describes works of art made by artists who have deviated from the norms of realism. These deviations, which may involve one or more formal elements, such as line, form, and color, are made intentionally, often through improvisation, to serve expressive purposes. By disrupting and expanding the tradition of realism, artists may suggest time, memory, and individual experience, or refer to digital, photographic, or cinematic sources. It is a subjective approach to painting, that favors perception over seeing and which embraces subjectivity. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So when I read that, I, I sort of had this hit, like I'd never, one of the things that how I teach and how I think of art making is, is around juxtapositions and opposites coming together. And this idea of objectivity and subjectivity that you bring up here. I just had never really put those together as difference, as differences so much. You know, the subjectivity becomes something that's, um, it's more human, it's more random, it's more uh, emotional and 
that's what's so cool, right? Those, that's, the, that's the contrast that's going on in this work, in a way, in it, disrupted it, realism. There may even be other ways to say it. There's a wonderful new podcast out with Alyssa Monks, who's, who's one of the artists in the book, if you follow John Dalton's podcast. And she talks a lot about the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Here's why I think this kind of painting is showing up right now. Here, here's how I think these elements are coming together. Uh, back when I was in art school, and I've heard a lot of people in my generation say this, we mainly had instructors that came out of abstract expressionism. Right. Or maybe out of pop if they were a little bit uh, yeah. younger. And if you wanted to get training in skilled realism, realism with a really strong basis, maybe at a bigger school you were lucky, and there was that one guy trained in, in Eastern Europe, you know, or the old school illustrator, somebody yeah. could really yeah. do that for you. Right. But a lot of times you had to teach yourself. But that began to change 80s and 90s and into the new millennium because of the New York Art Academy was founded. The Florence Academy was founded. The Slade School in the UK had a lot of grounding and representation. So now there's a generation of artists that they really have the chops. You know, yeah. if, if, if they really want to, if they want to give you a full on Rembrandt, they can do that. Yeah. And for people that do that that beautifully. But the other side of it, now let's do the, the flip side of it, is I think that the, uh, the stigma of abstraction has gone away. Uh, baby boomers, remember, used to go in a museum and there'd usually be a mom hauling her kid away from a mother well. And yeah, said, right, oh, right. Honey, get out of here. You know, and, and, you know, there was hostility uh, to abstraction. That's gone now. And abstraction and uh, representation really are free to mingle. <laughs> They're free to move about the room and, right. and work right. with each other. And I think in disrupted realism, the subjectivity is that these different ideas, different ways of thinking, even different generations of painting, they're doing things together. Yeah, they're, they're coming, coming they're it coming out together. with new hybrids. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I really wanted to learn to draw and, and I couldn't get a drawing class. I couldn't find... I knew from my father that, that, you know, you had to learn to draw, but that was not a requirement, you know, in, when I was going to school and I had to really, you know, I ended up going to a different school in the end, but, and where I did learn more of the basic foundational principles and drawing and, um, but yeah, you're very, you're, it's so true. There, there, it was not stressed. It was just more. I, mean, I heard from a few people and it, I don't say it lightly because it's kind of sad. I've had three people tell me that, oh yes, there was one professor at their college that taught the old ways, but that guy was an alcoholic. And yeah, yeah. modernism had really ruled uh, for a couple of decades. Yeah. We had, you know, that old eccentric guy who was, uh, do, you, do you remember, he's passed now, but do you remember the, the uh, draftsman? He had all these books. His name was Bern Hogarth. And he, oh, yeah. He taught yeah, that, yeah. Like, I studied with that guy, but he, he, was, he was like how you described him. I don't think he was an, an alcoholic, but he was an eccentric, an old guy. And, right. you know, just, okay, you could take him if you wanted, you know, and he was, he was so knowledgeable, you know. But, but he had, he'd had years of rolling his eyes at what the other people thought was art. And I have to tell you, way, way back for a couple semesters, I taught at Art Center, probably even when you were there, I taught in art history. But the really, really good... What the people that I would think of now as painters would get shoveled into illustration. Yeah, yeah. They would Which, say, oh, you're drawing, that's terrific. You need to get out of the art major. And That's and what happened to me. Yeah. That's what happened to me. That's why I, I became an illustrator. I, you know, and it was, it was a transition that I made later into fine art. But yeah, that's exactly, I mean, that's amazing that you're seeing that. Um, oh, it was, it, we saw it all the time. And some of the best painters I've interviewed would say, yeah, and I did illustration at Art Center or some other school. I said, yeah. of course you did, because that's where you got your training. Those kinds of majors, they had a sense of purpose that fine art was losing. Because right. going to fine art and, you know, are you going to go Nam June Paik and hook together televisions? <laughs> or are you going to make an installation in your friend's studio? Or are you going to walk the dog and have it be conceptual? Everybody was so confused. Yeah, it was confusing. And if you didn't, if you weren't interested in that, uh, it, it was, which I wasn't, you know, um, fascinating. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting that you noticed that, that trend, you know? So talk about a little bit about um, why you think this, this sort of fracturing of realism and what, what's happening. And I, I, you know, it relates to technology and iPhones and Instagram and just the influx of 
the modern technology. One of the things I say in the book is I say that we are the most distracted society in the history of the world. Mm. And since I didn't live in, you know, the Paleolithic era, I don't really have a comparison. I'm, I'm kind of reaching, you know, with that one. But I know for myself, speaking for myself, I am so overwhelmed so much of the time. Uh, and I have the anxiety that I think many of us have with too much Twitter, too much news, too many choices. And I want to go back to newspapers and blogging for a minute as just one example of that. Uh, when our parents uh, got up in the morning, they put on their slippers and they pick up the newspaper. And that front page of the newspaper has carefully selected stories that a table full of editors have said, yeah, this is what you need to see today. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's on the front page. And compare that with the way we get news now. We maybe go on Facebook or we go on some social media or we go on Apple News. And which of the 350 stories do we end up clicking on? Yeah. How many do we click for more than 10 seconds? You know, they told me at the Huffington Post, uh, the editor told me, she said, John, when you write a blog, don't take the page count too seriously. And this is, by the way, this is 10 years ago. I said, well, why not take the page count seriously? She said, well, their research showed that about two out of 100 people would read the average blog all the way to the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? It's worse now, I promise you. <laughs> it's worse every day. Yeah. So anyways, we are distracted. And, and you think about, uh, and then you can apply this to yourself or apply this to, to kids or younger people if you have kids in your life. Um, we've all grown up with movies. We've grown up with, when I say screens, screens are videos, screens are pages. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've all grown up with social media. We've had so much come through our minds. And these things become a part of us. Everybody has a, a favorite movie or, or three or 10 that the scene is embedded in their memory. And those things mix with, you know, what actually happens in your life and who are the people that actually are in your life. They mix in with R2-D2 and the lawyer that gets eaten in Jurassic Park and Meryl Streep and uh, all these other things. It's, it's like culture has become nature. That's how Robert Hughes put it. Boy, that's and great. become our memory. So all this stuff is in us, and, and one way or the other, when you're painting, it's going to make its way out because painters are trying to find their center. Mm -hmm. Painters are in the quiet of the studio. I think you know that painting has an aspect of meditation, and you get the door closed, and you shut your phone off, and you get everything out of there, and what comes out of you comes from all of these things in our life, from the mundane and the distracting to the profound, and somehow it's got to coalesce and find form in your painting. Yeah. But the, but the, the disruption part, personalizing it, right? I mean, this, the subjective aspect of this where we see things that look like things that we see, but then in much of the work in this book, we're, we're, we're taken, we're disrupted. We're taken to another place. It's altered. It's changed. Why are artists responding in that way now? Well, they're like everyone else in society. Everybody has to, has to personalize to survive. Because when you're presented with too much information, you have to say to yourself, what do I make of it? What am I going to do with this uh, information? And there's a couple ways you could go. I mean, one way to go is just be a, a follower. You find someone or something that you just listen to, and that's your whole source of, you know, I'm getting everything from this source because I can't sort it out on my own. But if you're a little more ambitious and you are a little bit deeper, um, you have to make sense of it. You have to make your way through the things that are happening so you find out what matters to you and what's important and what moves you and what do you find is beautiful. And again, that's what painters are doing in their studio and doing on their canvases. So of course it's personal because personalization and perception, perception, by the way, is seeing something, but with that added element of, of feeling it, of adding an emotional content, uh, you know, a response to the thing that you're uh, seeing. There's a lot of perception in disrupted realism, and that's part of the subjectivity. Yeah. Well, you know, it's also like, it's kind of like COVID right now, you know, it's, it's like we, now these times are different and, and the, the pictures of the flowers or the picture that I was going to paint six months ago is going to be different. Like there's, there's a, a, an urgency or, a, or a, 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 a new effort that needs to be made 
based on what's actually happening. The old way no longer is relevant, right? You know, it's like certain jokes now are, they're just not funny or they, it just doesn't strike you because of the seriousness or whatever the times are, are, uh, are making, are occurring, whatever's happening right now. So this influx of just tons of stimulation and, and, and being able to see people doing things simultaneously all over the world, millions of people, you, you really sense the seething mass of the world. I don't know if this sort of realistic, I mean, this is how I think about it, like the old way of conjuring up reality actually is accurate anymore. And so when I saw this book, I saw these artists, like, it needs, it's unexplained. There's pieces of this, of these pictures that invoke mystery and wonder and, and, and they discombobulate you a little. I mean, that's how it feels to be alive right now, in a way. Well, and there, there's a spiritual aspect to a lot of yeah. it. And uh, I always admired what the poet Lorca said, which he said in the, something, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, all we have is mystery. And yeah. All we have is, is mystery. And uh, the artist in this book, in one way or another, they are both showing us things, things you can recognize, bits and pieces of, of the objective world, you know, what a camera yeah. might see or what you might right. see in a movie. It's like footholds in, in reality, yeah. Footholds in reality, but then they also maintain the mystery. And the mystery is where the viewer, you or I or, or anyone else, is led into the painting. And I'm a big believer, let's go back to something you were saying. Mm -hmm. You were saying it's, it's personalized. I think there's a paradox, the personal, in the hands of a great artist is the gateway to the universal. It takes you into something really, really deep through one person's experience. And that's one of the things that really talented artists can do. They just say, I'm gonna give you something from my world and you're gonna find a way in. And that's the conversation. I love that. I, I'm, I'm writing down, that's why I'm looking down because I'm writing this personal versus, you know, as a gateway to the universal. Well, I'm becoming like, mis, mis, you know, retired teacher and you're taking notes. This is really familiar. No, no, but, but I, teach, I teach a lot of artists. I help a lot of artists and, you know, and of course it's around helping them connect with who they are and what they want to make and what's meaningful for them and how to communicate that. And, you know, when it becomes personal, it creates connection, but really the connection's the gateway. The connection is, is the portal, it's the mystery that then allows me to enter someone's world and just go, whoa, I want, I, 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 I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just a buyer, I just go in, not a buyer like as a purchaser, but I just invest, I'm, I'm, I'm in it, I just go in it, you know? And that, that's a powerful thing that artists struggle with learning how to do, at least the ones that I help. Um, so I, I just, I love that, you know, it's, it's, you know, style is, is too, is too small of a word to describe this, but it really is the, it's, it's understanding that it's the personal that you bring to it that becomes the biggest part of your work that, that makes it apply to so many people and, and creates all of the energy around it and all the people that come into it. Big work allows more people to enter it which makes it more saleable, which makes it more applicable to people's lives. They can see themselves in it. Do you know That's what I mean? Exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Did all these artists, I mean, they might not even know the words. I mean, are, are they, do they get this the same way? I mean, I was kind of reading, you know, you have questions that you ask them and they, they're kind of, some are in this and some of them are sort of outside of it. I don't know if all of them, do all of them think of what they're doing in this way or... No, Do you know what I mean? Absolutely yeah. not. No, they're all they're yeah. all individuals. And uh, you know, when I was organizing the book, first of all, there were a few people I couldn't I couldn't get. I would have loved to have Dana Schutz or Jenny Seville. Uh, their careers are too big, right? I yeah, couldn't right. do that. Um, also, there were a few people who very politely said no. And and when I got a no, it was because of what we talked about earlier. You know, someone would say, "I'm I'm very nervous about being labeled." about being packaged as being, well, I'm a part of, of this uh, thing. And you'd mentioned the word style. There is no style. Well, disrupted realism is not a style. Right, right, uh, right. And people want me to kind of codify it. Like, what's it look like? Is this a style? I know one thing that I've had people say to me at openings, they say, well, you know, uh, Gerhard Richter, he painted uh, photorealistically, but then he took a squeegee to it. So if I take a squeegee to my work, am I disrupting? 
Yeah, right. And I just say, you know, if you if you want novelty, if you just want to, uh, you know, mess around, of course you can do that. But I think that each of the individuals in this book has their own point of view that has come to them after years and years of years of being in the studio, of mm-hmm. conversation, of thinking mm-hmm. about it. They have found their way of uh, of doing it. So, you know... I think a lot of people are happy to be in the book. We've had some artists who get new collectors and and make sales and get shows. And I'm, I'm very happy to have made that happen. But I've had a few people tell me too, wow, John, it was great to be part of that book. The work I'm doing now wouldn't fit at all. And I say, fantastic. Let's have a beer. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it's, it's interesting that, you know, all these artists have their, their art making skills are amazing. You know, that's, that is something that every single artist in this book has. Do you know what I mean? Like it's apparent, like they can draw, they've got, they know color, they know, you know, but then where they take it, it's just, it's just their own personal odyssey. I mean, you're talking about an idea. You're just talking about an idea, really. You're not filling, you're not saying these people are that idea. It's just, you can see that idea in all these different expressions. I studied with a, an old school uh, abstract expressionist painter named Frank LaBelle. And uh, Frank had a saying, he'd say, nothing worth anything is easy. Yeah. And uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of art in this book. There's a lot of careers in this book that are hard won. Oh, yeah. uh, people uh, working very, very hard to get to this place of finding that junction of skill and personal expression. Mm-hmm. It, it takes, it's a lifetime and they're still going. I, I like what the critic Peter Frank says. He says, most of what's out there is a rehearsal for the real thing. And uh, yeah. absolutely. A lot yeah. of rehearsal. Wow. So you're, you're, um, this book's come out. It's, it's being, you know, it's pretty popular. I imagine. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I, I have to brag. It sold it, the first printing sold out in two and a half months which is very unusual for a hardbound uh, art book. Uh, so I really credit the artists involved for uh, speaking so highly of the book. They shared it on social media and I felt like I had 38 people rooting for the book to yeah, do well. Yeah, and that yeah. made it happen. Having done this book now, this is, this is a, it's like a painting for you. You know, this is a project, you created this, you made this thing. Um, what is your takeaway now looking back on it and, and how, how are you thinking about your next thing and what is that next thing? And what, what have you learned in this? Like you, you just did this thing. So if I wanted to create a book, you'd say, listen, let me just tell you one thing, you know? Well, here's a, here's a practical thing. And, and this practical thing, this comes from me. It also comes from my wife, Linda. My wife, Linda is a, a romance writer who, who does oh. extremely well. She, you know, it's a two writer family, but writers in different wow. fields. And something I really learned through Linda and I, I kind of knew this going in writing a book, say writing or assembling a book, that's maybe 20% of the effort in publishing. The other 80% is marketing. Mm. It's about, hey, I have a great book. How can I show it to you? How can I sell it to you? How can I interest you in it? So you're giving me, that's why I'm so grateful to you. You gave me a big boost when you mentioned the book. So I, I namaste. Oh, yeah. I no. value you on that one. So you helped. But I think uh, someone like yourself that has a platform you're going to have success publishing because a lot of people know who you are. But for the artists who are listening or people thinking of writing a book, I would just say to you, have an idea about your, your audience and have an idea who you're writing for and how you reach them. Or you may be spinning your, your wheels would be the practice. Yeah, because thing. now it's so important uh, for these publishers. That, I mean, to be, they need to know that you, someone's going to buy this book. You know, they used to find that, I guess. I, I heard that publishers used to market your book, um, but that's not, that's not so much the reality now. You know? There's a reason that so many celebrities are writing books because, uh, you know, if Madonna writes a children's book, it's going to be on the table at Barnes and Noble. If Barnes and Noble reopens, <laughs> I mean, everything's in flux right now. All right. But being a somebody is, is important. Um, so anyways, that's, that's something about the practical side of writing. But then the other part of it is I do have another book project. Oh, and good. It's, on, it's on hold right now, but I'll tell you what it is. Same publisher. Um, I'm working on a project called Almost Something. And Almost Something is about the roots of abstraction. Uh, where does abstract art take off from in our world? And so it has a, a, a little bit of a link to disrupted realism, you know, mm-hmm. that element of abstraction. But what I wanted to do as a writer, 
I don't want to go to openings the rest of my life and have people say, there's that disrupted realism guy. That's all he knows. <laughs> and I, I want to say, no, no, it's something different now. So I'm, I want to move into abstraction. And then I have another sideline. I write about uh, Asian art. Uh, just oh, in a wow. kind of, uh, you know, I write for a publication called Arts of Asia that's based in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And I try to do research pieces, play, pieces and be a, a journalist. So I'm always mm-hmm. doing something there. But that's, that's the answer. I do have a book on abstraction. I told the publisher, let's, put the pause, let's hit the pause button while the pandemic is on because everybody is uh, more scattered than before. Artists don't know what's next. The gallery owners don't know what's next. And, I thought, and it's going to change your book. You know, it's going yeah. to, yeah. I've been working on a book uh, just about, because my whole platform is around art and life and lessons applied to both and everything. And I've been working on the um, book proposal part of it. And, and it's now changed because of what's just happened, you know, and I'm so glad that, you know, I, I procrastinated as long as I did because it's a different book in a way now. So I imagine, I think it's a good move to just wait till we get some sense of what this is. I had, a, I had a small, uh, my wife would tell you, a small, tiny little nervous breakdown uh, in, in finishing this book. And I'll tell you what happened. As a blogger, I could always change my mind. Even on the HuffPost, I'd post something. Three hours later, I'd say, oh, wait a minute, paragraph seven. That's, that's oh, crap. Yes. I would go out and I would change it, and I could always change it. Well, this book was just about done. You know, the interior was done. The design was done. I'd approved everything. And they said, great, John, we're almost there. We're going to send you the uh, cover. So they sent this, you know, they sent a PDF of this, of the cover. And I looked at it, and I had instant reaction. I said, that's awful. We can't do that. Um, I had this idea that you shouldn't put letters over a, a painting. The, the cover painting is by Daniel Bilodeau. Yeah. And I just thought Daniel's not going to like that. And that's a graphic uh, error. And, you know, we can't have it. And I just, I went to bed upset and I was like all freaked out about it. And then the next morning I got up and Linda said to me, she said, you know what? That cover's terrific. You know, ah. it, it's excellent. You need to take another look. And I went and looked and I, I said, you're right, and the cover is, is great, Let, let's go with it. But what it was about was I think that I was realizing that the book was gonna be final, that it was gonna be printed and I couldn't change it anymore. Wow. And I, it just sort of threw me like, oh my God, this thing's gonna go into the world and I'm gonna be done after all this, put this in, take this out, edit this. So that yeah. was my, my tiny nervous breakdown. Yeah, you're not working in real time, you know? You, you're not like a painter that gets to just change something and look at it and tweak it and change it. You, at some point, you, you are done, and then you have to roll this thing out. And then you got to market it and stand behind it, you know? Some factory in China is going to print 3,000 of them, and then they go the thunk on the coffee table. And, uh, you know, it, it scared me to think about it. One of the challenges that artists have, and we talked about it earlier, is just finding their way. Have you seen, or is there any kind of common uh, ideas or uh, occurrences or things that have occurred in artists' life? I mean, like, you know, challenges and struggles often create breakthroughs, but, you know, like, you've seen so much. Like, what, what, how, if an artist is starting out or they've just been working for a few years and they don't like most of what they're making and, but they, they catch glimpses occasionally of something sort of out of reach they're going for. You know, like in the beginning, it's so, it's so challenging. It's so murky, but they still trotting forward. I mean, did, did you ever get a sense, see commonalities in people that did kind of make it through what yes. they did or how they got there? I, I would love to hear any, any advice or thoughts you had on this. I know other artists would as well. Well, a couple of things. First of all, you have to have humility and you have to have a sense of humor. Um, a lot of the interviews I did with the Huff Post were, you know, friends and, and, and their friends, uh, mm-hmm. emerging artists and so on. But I, I got to interview a few people that were, were notable. And uh, one day I got Wayne Tebow's phone, phone number and was able to call him up and interview him. And it was amazing because it was no nonsense. He doesn't even think of himself as a fine artist. He still thinks of himself in a way as a commercial artist. And he wanted to talk about work ethic and what time he gets to the studio and how much he gets done. And there was, there was none of that puffery. And I think you and I, we've all been to openings where, where we find someone who's maybe grandiose or they're or they have a lot to say. And I've begun to realize, well, that's, the insecure person, that's the person that's, that's mm-hmm. struggling to uh, define themselves. 
But if you have that humility and straightforwardness about you, what yeah. you do, it's, it's a huge uh, advantage. Yeah. And the other thing I would say uh, is that I certainly have known a couple artists that have had a really tough time that have dealt with anxiety and uh, depression. But I've heard again and again that sometimes that, that anxiety or that depression, that's before the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. It is uh, the work that's being done, uh, the things that are difficult to carry. If you keep carrying them, if you, if you work through it, that's what's going to take you to, to real meaning and to real sincerity in your artwork. So if you have lived that cycle, if you feel that sense of, of up and down, be ready for the other side. I yeah, I would say. Yeah, I, I definitely noticed that, John, in my own work. And, and I pointed out, I can even sense it in other people's work, that it's like this agitation and it's not working. And it's like, listen, uh, this, is, this is what it actually feels like before a breakthrough. I mean, it's, it's literally, it is coming. You know, it's coming. You don't just, you have to break through. A breakthrough isn't a breakthrough unless there's this period of just, it's not right, it's not right, you're going in this door, it's not working, you're not this door, you're going back and forth. It just seems to be what occurs. And then then there's a, a release and, and then you go for a while. And, and it's interesting because you talk about ego and it's in those periods of like when all things are falling into place that, you don't want to glom onto that either. You know, you don't, you don't want to uh, totally attach to your, the win of this easy period because it's going to end real soon, you know, but you don't want to take the hard time that seriously either. You know, it's just kind of like, you just want to be even, you know, and I've heard the same thing about Wayne Tebow that you describe him because um, he's up here in Davis still, uh, that he's just so down to earth, you know, and he's just interested in making work and, so cool, you know, and he's just a, such a master, but he just doesn't even, he's not going to, he's not going to attach himself to that because it just gets in the way, you know. No, and the same was true of Diebenkorn and, and many of the other really? artists that we admire. I think the most, the most accomplished people are the ones that are the least affected. <laughs> uh, it's kind of beautiful to see. Yeah, wow. Wow, that's a great way to put it. John, listen, thank you so much. Uh, this is, this is, uh, I think, the start of a, a long, uh, Conversation, well, longer conversation. The five hour podcast. I'm, I'm <laughs> just getting started. But. Yeah, no, it's just really great. Thank you so much. Okay.